So today we're at Motorcyclopedia, and uh, I'm welcoming a little, a little Ed, which is Ed yeah. Roth's son. Dennis Edward Roth is my real name, Ben. Uh, you know, I grew up at the shop in Maywood uh, because Dad had us working a lot of time because uh, basically after he signed the contract with Ravel, and that was to supply a car a year to Ravel. So me and my brothers, uh, after 5 o'clock when Robert Williams and all the guys went home, uh, me and my brothers and my dad would go in the back and build this stuff. And all these things are formed out of plaster and vermiculite. Uh, some of the early cars were all just a plaster buck. And then we put fiberglass over it and smooth it down and then get in the back and rip it out like on the original Beatnik Bandit. But by the time we got to this, we were using a lot of vermiculite in it, uh, Teddy, so we could sh uh, shape it with a sure form. Dad would use a trowel and then a sure form file. Okay. And then we glass all over this. And then that, that way was, there was only one vehicle like this, which took a long time. It took a year to build a vehicle like this because of, uh, you know, just sometimes you would put plaster on a side and come in the next day and the whole car would be like laying on the ground. So the basic way we did it, we built the chassis first and then did the buck on top of that. But it was, uh, uh, your story, so basically when this was built, you were around 12 years old. Yeah. So uh, knowing, and you had just shown, showing us the photo yeah. where you and your brother were sanding on the original, you know, the unfinished body. Yeah. So when I spoke to you on the phone, uh, I didn't know your age or anything yeah. about you. And then- uh, I was born in 55, the year of the greatest Chevy. And my dad, Big Daddy, he was born in 1932, the year of the best Ford ever. So I told dad that, you know, later on in our life, he goes, dad, you know, best Ford, best Chevy. He goes, that's the way it should be. In the, uh, in the book on how to, the flip book on how to uh, extend a front end, uh, one of my brothers had a flip book from Disneyland that, you know, showed like Mickey Mouse doing something and all the, you know. The cartoon you know, books that. were. So dad goes, I'm making a flip book of how to extend a front end with the Model A A bones. And so in that uh, book, that, this front end right here is the front end from that book uh, where it has Fuller and Robert Williams showing you how to, extend a front end. So this is one of the early, early tykes. And dad, the first thing he got into was trikes before he got into two wheelers because we could build a body for it, you know, and. Uh, so that's the radius rod that Ed's talking about. Yeah. Uh, made a perfect match to go over the springer and extend it to yeah. whatever length you like. You can cut them to length, whatever your choice. The bottom already had a half inch hole. Yeah. So miraculously, it was like they're made for it. Right. So, uh, good idea. You know, when I was a little kid, Dad had sent me underneath Model A's. We'd be out in Phoenix or something. He'd go, go get the A-bones from that deal, you know, because they was extending uh, front ends. And the reason we got into trikes, and this is the first one, is because we could build a body for it. With the two-wheeler, you know, there's not, you know, you can mold it. Well, it, Dad ended up having a two-wheeler, but this was our first venture into trikes. Even with the SU carburetor on it, though, Dad didn't like the horsepower of it. So he went straight from this to the California Cruiser. The V, the V8. Yeah, so we're, he's building the one with the V8 in it. Uh, he got the engine from Mickey Thompson, that 215 Oldsmobile aluminum block, because he wanted something lightweight. Um, but when we started building the trikes in a kit form, we used the 289, and we called them the Cobra trikes. Because they were actually sold as a kit. Yeah. Because uh, I see more than one available. I, there wasn't just one. Oh, no, yeah. Dick Allen uh, did the uh, chassis and we did the bodies. So dad was uh, kind of partners with Dick Allen in those. But what happened was, is unfortunately, a Maywood cops kid got killed on one of our V8 trikes. And so that's when my mom kind of put the kibosh on the V8 trike kits. And we went over to uh, the Volkswagen uh, kits. But I think there was so much more as far as a theme that you can do with a trike. Yeah. Which you never can do with a two wheel or maybe besides this dragon man with his body, yeah. uh, you know, doing that. But uh, that's probably the extent of it. Yeah, because uh, later, later on, dad did fix up a bike he called Oink. And there's a picture of him on it at the uh, Chino prison run uh, with the iron cross on the, on the sissy bar. And, uh, and I, he, he was already calling them hogs. Yeah. Pigs, you know, yeah. as far as that. His bike was named Oink. Yeah, and the idea of Harley, uh, you know, the Harley Hog was well 
well stated before Harley Davidson. Yeah. Uh, and uh, my mom and dad would go down to the LAPD auction and they would, they would buy pan heads like in 1968, they were changing over to Honda four cylinders. And you know, later on in the nineties when me and dad were driving around with the new beat Nick bandit, I'd say, Hey dad, you know, cause I was only like 10 then I was going to or 12 and he goes, uh, well, we never paid like over $300 for a bike, a pan head from the cops. And he goes, I got them as cheap as 150 bucks each. So it was 68 and dad could order a shovel head engine. So he ordered shovel head engines and me and my brothers, uh, couldn't take apart the pan head 74 inch or lift them up into the dumpster. Dad said, take those pan heads and throw them away. So we, we couldn't lift them. So what we did is we started taking them apart and just threw all the parts, take off the sun. And, you know, and I think back now to like 1968, Teddy, me and my brothers were throwing pan head engines away. Well, the value of the whole motorcycle was relatively minimal. So yeah. the heads themselves, the parts, I mean, as the years, but it took quite a few years for them to get any decent value. But I remember one article your dad wrote about the Harley throttle, the worm with the cable and everything that goes inside. So everybody would put the British throttles with the snap throttle and yeah. they were a couple bucks, you slide them on. He says, I don't know why anybody would get rid of that throttle, the quality. And he knew way, way back in 1968, yeah. you got to keep the Harley throttle. Yeah. So uh, pretty much uh, ahead of his time. But as I, as I said originally, when I met your dad in the 1967 or 68, uh, you know, I'm a kid in high school, or just got out of high school, and your dad uh, thought, oh, yeah, Ted, you built a pretty good bike with a sidecar. I was like, oh, man, I'm, I, I just, you know, was uh, really, uh, you know, engaging where, you had the self-worth to go further right. with the hobby or with the business. So I got to thank your dad, you know, for recognizing. Uh, yeah, you me. know, uh, when we were growing up, uh, uh, Big Daddy brought us up to be free thinkers. Not so much outside the box, but free thinkers. And I knew like at an early age, uh, maybe, you know, in third grade, don't repeat anything dad says at the shop at school because they don't, I had, challenged my teacher in the third grade about parallel lines or something. And, uh, you know, I said, well, no, dad, my dad said they can cross behind the moon. You don't know. And, you know, later on that day, I got the talking from my mom. Don't repeat anything dad says at school or anything that goes on at the shop at school. So, but that in that way, dad, be, you know, after school and at the shop, I learned, you know, uh, almost anything is, you know, everything's possible or at least try it. You know, any concept of last whatever you know in the automotive field and I think that's what dad was good at you know just being a free thinker so I think when we when we look at like that one article 1961 in Sports Illustrated Sports Illustrated is basically very mainstream with every other football baseball and then to look at custom cars and say hey this guy Ed Ross coming on he's coming up and I I don't know which there's like a video that was out or maybe it was a CD talking about, you know, the shapes and finishes, metal flake, the idea where it, it's, it's went to cell phone covers, you know, it's still with us today. Yeah. Uh, well, see, when I was a kid and the outlaw and the beatnik bandit and cars came back off tour after three years, they're chipped up and marked up. So when I was 10 years old, dad had us mask off the outlaw and the beatnik bandit in 65. And, you know, first time I ever used a block, cause usually we we're just running the hard stuff, uh, you know, Anyway, from painting that metal flake, the Beatnik Bandit and the Outlaw Metal Flake, I, I got a good education when I was 11 years old. Now I'm 66, so I got 55 years flaking. And, uh, it, you know, it's changed a lot through the years. The clears, there was no clear when we metal flake. Metal flake was real metal. So the Beatnik Bandit and the Outlaw, the clear we used was the laminating resin that we actually built these cars with. Okay. Because, you know, they only had like lacquer clear and that wasn't going to fill in flake. Okay, okay. So dad would just fill his Binks number no. seven gun with laminating resin, thin it down a little bit and spray it. And I, I remember the day after, the night after we sprayed the California Cruiser, you know, it was, there's runs and drips on it. And we came in the next morning and dad just kind of knocked the drips off of it. You know, it's got flaked and all this clear on it. And then he takes 40 grit sandpaper and starts color sanding it. 
because you know the laminating resin's this thick on top of the metal flake. Well, the 40 grit sandpaper easily gets filled up with a piss coat of laminating resin. So it was, you know, a California cruiser had about this much clear on it, and then color sanded with 40 and another piss coat, and then he lettered it. And then a guy that in Colorado, I think he had it last, he goes, man, when I got down to that paint job, I couldn't get into it. I go, no, it's because it's gel coat, man. The paint is... So the finish was in the first epoxy of... Yeah. That was Just real like this epoxy. Right there too. Yeah. This, you know, this was really a lot more pink. You know, it's turned brown, but I think a lot of that brown comes from the laminating resin that Dad actually used as the clear. But you're taking this right here, uh, well over 50, 55 years old. Yeah. Uh, 55 years ago, you know, not holding up uh, too bad. No, that epoxy definitely kept it in check. The, the color's gone, but the clear is still there. So, but you know, now then they developed all these cooler clears, Teddy. They're really. But and also you had a good, you had a pretty good story with the Kragers. Yeah. And you know what? At first, when this this bike first came out, we had the old wire baskets where you took off the hubcap and put that little basket in there. And, tightened it on. But as Movie World opened up and Jimmy Brucker brought the cars into the Movie World Cars of Stars and Buena Park, uh, Dad sent me over to Parnelli Jones's because Parnelli Jones goes, look, I'm going to give you Kragers for everything. You know, I want Krager. When the cars are in the museum, I want to see them with Kragers on them. So I went over to Parnelli Jones and Dad just gave him a list of stuff he needed. And I went over there in a little, you know, ranchero and the, the tires were stacked, you know, to like the sky and just wrote down. I drove back to movie world. And that's when all the Kragers became on all the cars then, you know, they wanted to, well, Roy Richter was my dad's friend. You know, the guy that started uh, Bell, Bell Auto Parts, Bell Helmets. Right. Krager wheels are originally like Crane Garrett from Long Beach, but Roy Richter bought them right okay. away. You know, Richter bought them out, so. Yeah, Krager was the wheel of the day. Yeah. And then I, I believe that they were OEM on some cars later. They, they might have been a couple, yeah, because, maybe for a few years. Uh, I don't think Crane Garrett kept it very long before he, before Richter bought Krager, it. Yeah, because yeah, I, I have old Krager boxes that say Bell California on them. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Great times, but that's how we got into the motorcycles and trikes and uh, with Choppers magazine, we did a lot of. Well, like you know, you wrote to Dad when we had Choppers. Yeah, magazine. that's how I met him. You know, through the Choppers magazine, being on the East Coast, everything in California was super cool. And who knows, will we ever even get to California? Right, right, right. I mean, you don't know when you're a kid. They yeah. probably still had prop plane. No, they had jets. But uh, so basically, uh, with your Roth stuff between the uh, mailbox, we we talked about the trikes. The yeah. uh, the Tree Viper. And the uh, Panzer trike you got over there, the green one, the one we called the three-seater, that has our old phone number from Los Angeles on it, 213-587-9697. Okay. okay. So, so by this time, when we built the green one, Dad, we're kind of like, Mom and Dad are divorced now. We're kind of going into the trikes, and Dad's at Movie World. But uh, a journalist from the L.A. Times come by one day and wants to do a story on Dad. Goes, Dad goes, take that guy, the picture taker, and he put him in the back of the ranchero, and Dad's just driving down some streets in Maywin. The guy took a picture of it, and that's that picture you see of Dad driving down the streets in you know, Maywood there in the okay. residential district. Now, this is the latest thing, or the last thing we got, this pink bazooka yeah. that's electric, or else it was an attempt at solar? Yeah, and, and what that was is Dad made a mold of that. That's actually what's called the rubber ducky, the original bike that had the Honda uh, car engine in it in okay. the back. And so he had that body, and he just wanted to make something because, you know, solar was coming in. Right. So I think he put, a, like, a Honda 50 motor in there. Yes. And like, some kind of deal. So it was actually a miniaturized of the Volkswagen. Yeah. The far as and, the shape. Uh, the rubber ducky, the yellow one that looks just like that, that has the Honda head coming out of that hole on top. Well, we drove that. Like, I took my brother's two-wheel Honda, and Dad took... We drove up to... Uh, Reno, Salt Lake City, and went all over on that. And what he did, once we had the, he, he went ahead and glassed the drivetrain in. So it was just unibody on the yellow Honda. And then we spun it over and we filled all the cavity, Teddy, with that, you know, our material plaster and vermiculite. Okay. So then we took that out and he made an entire fuel tank. Okay. So a bike that size was carrying about 50 gallons of gas. 
you know, because everything void underneath it was filled with gas. So, and I, I don't know where that bike is, but that's so, the same So body. thinking about it, uh, the solar uh, would charge a small battery for ignition. Yeah. So essentially it was uh, solar powered because right. you're going to push start it or. Right. Right. And, I, and, you know, they got all the solar power panels a lot better nowadays. Yes. Than, you know, so. Yeah. How that stuff was back in the 80s. Yeah, yeah that was late 80s, yeah. early 90s. But Dad was working at Knott's Berry Farm then, and, uh, you know, old Walter Knott was still alive. It was seven, 1976, about, during the bicentennial. Okay. And Walter Knott had, like, this three- or four-seater golf cart. He drove around Knott's Berry Farm. And Dad went out there and just painted it all red, white, and blue stripes and everything. Man, Walter Knott loved that bike. So Dad worked at Movie World for... I mean, you know, for a while. Then Von Dutch came back, you know, and, uh, and worked at Movie World, then went to Knott's. And uh, l later on, 20 years later, uh, Daryl Anderson, you know, Marion Knott's son, is the one who put up all the money for the custom culture tour. You know, in the, in the okay. custom culture catalog, you open up, it says Daryl Anderson. That's okay. Marion Knott's son. But at the, at the Movie World, your dad always wore, he had the top hat and the tux. Yeah, he did. Yeah, that was kind of a signature. Yeah. Certainly the hat. Yeah, because yeah, Ravel wanted them to clean up. And I remember when I was a real little kid, we'd just leave the shop and go to uh, car shows. Well, Dad had a tux made big enough where he could just pull it up over his Levi's and put the shirt on over his dirty shirt and just, you know, step right into a tux. So he probably still smelled a little bit like fiberglass or whatever, but this tux was oversized so he could put it on over his dirty clothes. I think, you know, Ravel just wanted to make him look like, you know, hey, Ed. Because basically, uh, the Ravel, all the models were basically children oriented. Yes. So, so uh, by like 1965, they're making the uh, surf fight model, and Dad is in the uh, Saturday Evening Post as being the supply sergeant to the Hell's Angels. Well, that didn't go over too good with Ravel, so the uh, they pulled the model off the shelf, the little surf car with the surfboard on the side, surf fight. Right. They pulled that off the shelf, so that made the Surfite model just rocket in value because if you have an original Surfite, it's worth thousands of dollars. Now they've reissued all those, yes, uh, yes. but now, but an original Surfite model is is that but it was about the year where uh, Ravel dumped my dad. You know, they just said no, Ed, mm, we're not going to do models no more because you know dad was they were trying to go towards the kids thing, and now you know the parents are going to say, well, that Ed Roth, you know. Mm, but I think when you go into a store now, they don't even have toy stores. But I know the last stores, maybe 20 years ago, KB Toys or whatever, yeah. there were still some models in there. I don't know if there's even maybe online, but there was no models really available. Yeah, well, you know what? Just lately, I think it was last year uh, or the year before, Ravel went out of business totally. Pushed all their stuff out in the parking lot, had a big auction, and it's all gone. So now people do have those dyes from the 60s, and they're remaking the right. models, but it's not Ravel. But, you know, when I was a kid, man, Ravel was a big player. Yes. And, and as a matter of fact, in 67, when they made the first Hot Wheels, Mattel had a license, the name Beatnik Bandit, through Ravel. Okay. So, uh, you know, and then you got the little car and the little badge that said Big Daddy Ross Beatnik Bandit right. and stuff. Those are... You but know. anybody you talk to, 50, 60, 70, you know, had built an Ed Roth model. You know, one of the weirdest thing is I'm like 20 years old. I'm just out of the Army. I'm standing there at my booth. And who walks up, though? A guy named Jeff Beck, who's a guitar player. Okay. He goes, hey, man, I built all your dad's models. I go, wow. I was thinking, wow, he's Jeff Beck. You know, he yeah, built, right. I, you know I didn't have the concept. Like, they had the models in England, Germany, Japan, everywhere. My... You know, I was too young to understand that. Like, you know, the models were worldwide and made my, my parents a lot of money. Well, I think it's like the, the choppers in general in the late 60s, all the movies, all that, Germany, every, all of Europe, yeah. certainly, and wherever, uh, wherever there was free speech, a lot of that's, you know, people, you know, the youth wanted yeah. to embrace that. And yeah. that's what you're saying. So, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, Dad maybe got into it a little too early. But a lot of people come up to me and talk to me about Chopper's Magazine. And that was kind of like the end of Ross Studios and the beginning of Dad's, you know, crazy times. Well, they were all crazy times up to like when 70, 
five, I think my dad turned into a Mormon, and that's when he, everyone said, oh, Ed Roth, he's so soft-spoken and all this, and it's like, hey, baby, you don't even know what you're talking about. But, but for the Mormons, you know, he calmed it down a little bit. He was still, you know, when we went out on the road, he was big, he was my dad. Now, but he, when we got back to Manti, Utah, he was a Mormon again. So, but, and that was some of the reason why he moved to Utah, of course. Uh, yeah, because uh, when, when you're retired uh, Mormon, you, have to, you, you go up and work in these temples they have up there. It's like they had a temple in Manti. And uh, it's quiet, you know. I can understand Dad now, like, because uh, I'm that age. I don't live in L.A. I don't want to be in the city. I just like to be where it's quiet. I can do my stuff. And I think Dad had a better, you know, time at life, actually probably better up in Utah than uh, down in uh, California. Because now California, as you know, Ted, it's... You know. Well, yeah, you think, but your span of his uh, 30 or, say, from the early, early 60s through his uh, passing in uh, 2000 or 99... Uh, 2001, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, you know, touched a lot of people and, and does to this day. I mean, yeah. it, it's... and it was in every aspect of my dad's life. It wasn't just the cars or the bikes. It, he... he he was a free thinker about anything. Like, you know, this has been done this way for a long time. Well, you know, Dad would say, hey, we're going to do it this way, or at least try it. You know what I mean? If it don't work, then we know why. And I think that's the, the biggest thing I got from my dad. It was like in 2001, Dad died, and I built this card called the Max Dereon. I didn't even know what the Internet was, but the day after the SEMA show, it says, Little Daddy Roth builds tribute to his father. You know, overnight success, right, and all this. It's like... All right. Well, they said that, but I, you know, I've been building cards with my dad since second grade. You know, right. mixing up the original, like the outlaw, the beaten bandit, up to the surf fight. You'll see a lot of pictures of dad grinding or dirty Doug grinding. It looks like it's fiberglass, but actually, we used twenty-minute plaster as the buck. So they were they actually shaped the car by grinding it, and it wasn't up till like about the Orbitron where we got the mix down for the buck a little bit better to where we could tear it out of the back. So, uh, I, there's not much hand laid fiberglass at all. I don't even, no. even in production no. capacities. No, the guy told me they just cut, uh, put pieces in there or the both place and he goes, the resin gets sucked in. And I go, was that an autoclave? He goes, no, this is different than autoclave. You don't have to have it under pressure. You just lay the pieces in and the resin gets sucked in with no air. I go, you know, that, Spent many years just like pushing the bubbles out with a brush on these things, you know. It takes a, it takes a, a lot to do it, but you know when you get have it done, it, it's something that no one else has. So I think that's what you know. The old man was. But really I think uh, I'd have to say, Ed, good to meet you after so many years. Yeah. And hey, knowing uh, your family. I am so glad to be at this museum in Newburgh. I've always seen it. I've seen the mailbox and whenever I see the mailbox in a picture from Newburgh I go man that's the original paint job I go you you know because nowadays you'd paint it silver flake and okay. then rainbow it out okay well we rainbowed it and then we taped off the letters mailbox that's why when you run your fingers over it you can feel that yeah, the, it's the, thick flake the, you know that one really is you know god I had a you know because by then I'm 15 you okay. know and you know Knowing a lot more, the clear is better. And I think it's our responsibility now. We have to protect these for another 50 years. So yeah, Absolutely. I'm so glad they're right here, Teddy. Right. Of all things, I'm so glad to be here. You know, I came to Dead Man's Curve and then came over here to see the bikes because this is really my life. I remember Dad making all the welds, making them handlebars for that. The, the front end, me in that picture, pointing to the little oh, yeah, back. I, I mean, this brings back memories from when I was just, you know, the littlest kid. Yeah, but you think about it all, you yeah. know, filling it all, you know, uh, shaping the metal, filling yeah. in with the brass, fill in the pits again, yeah. grind it, fill in the pits again to get that so it's uh Yeah, the little flawless. cross, remember the little, that little wedge you seen weld on there where he put the head, the, these are all made out of Bondo, yeah. you know, these lights and stuff okay. and this, and then we glassed over it and then had a, you know, so the Bondo went cracked, then we had to like get in there, like you can kind of feel some... But, Fiber, I, you know. In a, these to mold this uh, uh, with brass. I know. Oh yeah. This is Indian Larry. Of course, Indian Larry, I believe, worked for your dad yeah. for a short period yeah. of time. But Indian Larry, another any Springer he had, he wanted it filled yeah. and molded. Yeah. 
So ideally, this, you know, to, to get it flawless, no pits, to get every pit out is a yeah, big deal. It takes, it takes a little time. And, you know, Dad had a, a great uh, a chrome shop then called Model Plating over in Bell Gardens. But just to see the spike and how beautiful it is. But Dad rode this, and this is the reason he started building VA trikes. He always said, this thing's too slow. Even though I had one of Carl Morrow's SU carburetors, he just thought it was too slow. And, uh, the Carl Morrow story is, yeah. is good. Because I didn't didn't know, yeah. he ended up using the front rod for the foot peg mount. Yeah, got that set screw. Then he's I'm re pretty sure from when I was a kid, like is that broken off? Yeah, that these pedals came up and were like here. Yeah, he. The other thing to use a narrow spool wheel, he reversed the rockers inside, oh, yeah, yeah. which is a good idea. But I don't know if he used a left and a right or two. But anyway, uh, you know, they're yeah, symmetrical. And the idea to get it narrow enough so you could use a 5 ace axle. So yeah. you didn't have the trouble with the axle. Yeah, you don't have the rockers out here. Like, right. See, that's something I wouldn't have even known or thought about when I was 13 years old, that the rockers on your side. I probably knew it, but like I right. forgot totally about it. And that so he, re he reversed the studs and the rockers yeah. and uh, pretty good idea. But there's the radius rod on the bottom, but yeah. uh, I never thought of that. Reverse the rockers to get the axle shorter. Yeah, to make it look yeah. tiny and stuff. Well, I think he liked the alloy rims and Macron or whatever. Yeah. And I don't know, that's one of the first places I saw the straight lace where the spokes would come straight out right. of the hub. Didn't have a lot of strength, but if it's only the front wheel. Yeah, like Buchanan's frame shop used to lace yes. our wheels up. And you bring back a lot of memories, Teddy. Yeah, he I mean, did for myself as well, yep. Yeah, unbelievable. I, you know, Dad made these little feet, like all this little metal stuff Dad made. Now, like I said, I'm sure these pedals went up to here now. You got some pedals back in yeah. here. I wonder if that's the ones that, uh, that were on here. Is it showing on the picture? How big the pedals were there? Yeah, this was a, this clutch came yeah. way up, so yeah. that pedal was way up, Don, so you I could think actually. I saw the pedals back here or, some, or somewhere. But besides the bodies, yeah, there they are right there. Or there's something that looks like them. But besides the bodies, my dad making all that metal stuff, you know, as a kid. Because my dad had one of those big Sears grinders. They didn't make the little ones back then. No, there was no Makita's. Yeah. Yeah. No, my, my dad had a big vice. He put his stuff in his vice like this. And, you know, I remember my dad's big hand just one-handing that big Sears grinder. And just, you know, he... My dad would just make everything, mounts, this, that, the whole deal. So, But my, me and my brothers had a lot to do with the bodies because that was fiberglass and we just, ooh. you know, at one point, my mother, we had the road agent in our garage and my mother put the bubble up on it because my mom was the only girl in the house. There's five boys and dad, six guys. We used the road agent with the bubble up as our hamper. Because the water, it was in the garage and washer and dryer was right there. Well, everything we had had fiberglass and plaster on it. So all those clothes we just throw into the road agent, and then my mom come out and do the clothes out of the road agent. He even molded the headlight bracket in. Yeah. And, br and brought it directly into the headlight. Yeah. And a little rat tail file right yep, in here. To get I can in see there. my dad doing that now, you know. Because Bates actually was the first to use the headlight. Yeah. KD made them, but Bates branded it, but to get that molded, but look at the shaping to get the yeah. taper. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, like I said, you know, dad used to be filling and grinding and filing. He did a lot of that, I can remember, because me and my brothers would be mixing plaster and resin thing this. And then sometimes he'd go riding with the angels and like, there'd be like one side of this is done. And he told me and my brothers, okay, pack stuff on the other side, you know, so when I get back, I can shape that. Good yeah. time. So a lot more information. You got the, you know, with the Carl's, Carl Morrow, a lot more yeah. uh, that we can add to these stories. Yeah. I try to write up everything so it's in the archives uh, for future beyond us. Right, yeah, absolutely. And, that, and I, I really appreciate that. Thank doing you. With all these, man. Thanks, Ed. And, you know, the... Uh, Mega cycle downstairs. Well, it was the M on it. You know, it was originally Captain Pepe's motorcycle and Zephyr Repair. That's, I'm glad you got them all. Dad, yeah. And they're being saved, you know, because that's what dad wanted. You know, before he started uh, getting older, 
And then he realized that, uh, you know, once my dad traded all the cars to Brucker, I told you, for, for a Volkswagen, 71 Volkswagen, all the show cars for a 71 Volkswagen. And I told dad, uh, you know, dad, you know, all these years of work we got in these cars and everything, he goes, you know what? He goes, anyone can own these cars, but they'll always be ours. And, you know, at 66, I can realize that I think now. it is a When good I was point. 15, you know, I didn't realize that. Because everywhere I go. Because what they are, it's like a painting. It's by whatever, the artist. Right. And it's a Roth. And that's the artist. Yeah. And it or it's is. not a Ford. It's not a Chevy. It's a Roth. So, yeah. I'm so glad it's keeping this thing happening. That's, well, we enjoy it. Uh, the visitors enjoy them. Yeah. And working on Chopper's Magazine all my life. Or, or for three those three years, you know, working in the dark room. Dad and Dad sent you that postcard. Send us some pictures. Yeah. Baby. Polaroids. Yeah, I was all like, oh, man, I, I got a letter. I got a postcard from Ed Roth. I was like, oh, man, I'm... Big hitter. Because I think a couple... After, my, after I got a high number in the lottery for the draft, I immediately quit college to yeah. do this. Right, right, right. So... Yeah, wow. What was your number, though? Do you remember? 327. 327? Of course, how could you not remember yeah, that, right. Teddy? Excellent. But you story. joined. You... Yeah, I joined in 73, and oh. I was in a nuclear missile battalion, so I didn't go to uh, oh, okay. Germany. I, I was in the 3rd to 79th instant death. Okay. Dad was in the military in uh, 40, 50 to 54. The, the Korean. And he, uh, but he went to uh, Africa. And he ended up getting malaria. So they sent him back to Shaw Air Force Base. And I have a picture of my mother when she's pregnant with my oldest brother and uh, standing in front of Shaw Air Force Base's exchange uh, panel that my dad had lettered, you know, from South Carolina there, Shaw Air Force Base. I go, man, dad, so dad was lettering like even when he was in the Army, okay, I mean, in okay. the Air Force, you know. He started out early. And so uh, originally, before the vehicles, he was a sign painter, uh, or, or well, both. Not really. You know what? He started out when he first got out of the Air Force. He was a display artist at the Sears on Soto Street in L.A. And uh, you know, my, my mom's mom got him that job there. But he, then he uh, started out with uh, the Baron. It was the Baron and Roth, and they were over on, and they were just doing that at night. But it got so good that my dad quit Sears and opened our own shop, you know, and, and, and then that's in 59 when he built the uh, Outlaw. And uh, we made a mold of the Outlaw and they sold a few of them, but once Ravel signed my mom up and dad to the contract, dad didn't want any, any of those out. So, uh, you know, then it was the Outlaw, Beatnik Bandit, Road Agent, Mysterion, the models were coming out then. And at one point we couldn't even build cars fast enough, so they did, dad bought a car, a tea bucket from uh, Bob Johnson, and just named it Tweety Pie and painted it up a little bit. Yeah, and they made a model of that. So that's like the only Ford they made. Because uh, there was all those guys, Dean Jeffries, Starbird. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, all that. George Barris. Yeah. You know, he was right up there. His, his uh, sister's always been the transportation director over at Universal, so he was always in with the movie. Okay. You know? Yeah, when, I, when I'd visit uh, that area, I'd, I'd visit George. He was always pretty friendly, yeah. talked about the show cars and the... Uh, the Larrabees and all yeah. with the... Bob Larrabee, you know, some guys like Bob Larrabee, Von Dutch, some of these friends of dad's that I've known, you know, since I can remember. And uh, I just saw Bob Larrabee this weekend, 92 years oh, old. Oh, that's what I was going to you know say. I mean? Down okay. The, uh, I go, you know, dad was lucky to make it to 69. My mom made it to 88. Okay. And so if I'm 66 now, I got like three years left if I die, you know, as like dad did, but... Yeah, my dad passed away in January 93, so I'm hoping my mom's 89. I hope I'm yeah. going forward or going... Yeah, well, I don't drink brake fluid, so I think I got a couple of more All years right. in me than dad did, you know, Teddy.